that um, the earth human cosmos is some sort of mandala or sacred circle composed of five dimensions. And by tending to each of them, then we gradually gain an increased sense of transparency between us and, and the earth. Next, I go into the dark. I go into the actual um, problematic, destructive dimensions of our relation to the earth. That is the, the, the main problem that we're trying to address. And one of the um, principles, I should say, of this study is how important it is not to shy away from that but to take it <coughs> at face value. So I go into it and, and also through a yogic and Buddhist lens, and I, I propose that uh, this, this notion of dukkha, which is often translated as uneasiness, anxiety, suffering, pain, it's the root of the ecological crisis. So the dukkha of the human, the pain of the human becomes the pain of the earth. But we know that dukkha, it's, it's ingrained in the human condition. So if I can refine that, it's like our inability to skillfully deal with our pain, personal pain, translates into the ecological devastation. So I'm trying there to cultivate a, a, a friendlier relation with suffering, both personal and collective. Um, and for this, the theory of the Klesias, as outlined in Patanjali Yoga Sutras, it's perhaps the main text, the main sacred text in which this exploration is grounded in, because of its amazing use in terms of making sense of the suffering. How does Patanjali uh, offer that counsel? Is by the Klesia. Klesia it's often translated as affliction, and he says there's five of them. And these five supposedly are said to explain and make sense and help us focus our efforts to relieve that pain. And those five are here, and I'm going to go into them in a little bit. So in the next chapter, what I do now, that's, that's the original contribution of, of the study, which is to say the psychological integration of the theory of the clashes with the theory of the uh, Indo-Tibetan theory of the elements in order to tackle the ecological crisis. So what I did here is study the literature and see if there were already notions and concepts that alluded to each of these afflictions. Um, and for the most part, yes, these four were already in the literature, and I added this, this one. Um, so let's start with this one. So the Klesia of Avidya, or ignorance, it's supposed to be the mother of the other Klesias. Without her, none of these could express. So this is defined as uh, an epistemological error, a fundamental obscuration of the human mind that uh, sort of like places us in a very weird position of taking what was not real as real, what's not the self as the self. And so it's an illusion. But the critical thing there is that we're not aware of it. So when, it, when I integrated with, with the element of space, see there's, there's a lot of information in green here. And so the exploration of the personalities of the different elements that I did in the previous chapter came handy here in trying to, to do in a way, this typology is some sort of system of resonances. Um, 
So the personality of these element is 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 intangible. It's some sort of like information that allows the other elements to express. So it, it shares a similar quality with Avidya. And uh, the name that I gave for this element is Eco Anasognosia. Anasognosia is a, a physiological disease where the patient is not aware of the disease. Even if there's like overwhelming evidence of the disease like the phantom limb kind of thing, for example, where like chopped arm and the person still believes that they have the arm and they move it around. So I thought, well, that explains very well the predicament that we find ourselves in. And w w when I say we all throughout the dissertation, it's industrial citizens, industrial societies. You guys should say a word about that. How am I doing with mm -hmm. time? Uh, maybe you can presuppose the industrial society okay. part. All right. So I say we, industrial citizens. Um, <clears throat> yes. So this is a simplified version of, of the last table that I have in the dissertation because there's many more resonances to be made. But this gives you, hopefully, a sense of, of what I was trying to do. And what I'm trying to do here is move from what I've already mentioned I consider to be the root of the ecological crisis That's, this is the yoga of the earth human cosmos going in that direction, which is to say through the marriage of equation with an element, I propose um, the way, in a way, the way the equation manifests in industrial growth society um, and in the ecological crisis. How does it ex express, what are the psychological mechanisms behind it, for example, for this? There's a lot of studies that says that uh, there's a phenomenon called cognitive dissonance, where it's very similar to an osognosia, but at a collective level, and especially about like, climate change, where we know all, we have all these graphs, we have all these data, we have all these um, different studies that uh, we're not doing all that well. But we keep business as usual. We keep living our lives and operating in a society as if that was not happening. So we select selectively choose the information that keeps the system going and does not threat our psychological um, structures that are in place that go along with that system. And it's some sort of like positive feedback loop of reinforcement, not only uh, within ourselves, but between the different members of the so society, because there's a great need of belonging. A lot of studies have suggested that belonging is much more important than truth. And uh, in a society where our sense of identity, our sense of self, is pretty much indoctrinated and imposed as a reduced um, expression of what the spiritual tradition of say we are. Um, this, this just like keeps the, this, the cycle going. And this takes us to the second eco-psychic element, which is the human superiority complex, uh, which I'm thinking I'm not going to have time to go into them individually, but I hope that you're getting a sense of, of what I'm trying to do here. Um, one thing that I do want to say is that these, these five elements can be seen as the five main nodes of Maya, of the veil of separative consciousness, that it's in place and is constantly nurtured by the industrial system. 
So then when someone asks you, like, oh yeah, you think the ecological crisis is the crisis of human consciousness? Yes, oh yeah. And what do you, you know, what are you going to do about it? How, how do you go about that? Well, this, this can be a way of, of trying to tackle that and maybe explain this person. Um, so then having laid this out, some professor suggested, well, you can maybe just end it there. But I was like, no. <laughs> so, uh, that would be hard. Uh, because it's like, well, then what are you going to do about it? Right? How, how are you going to heal those things? And actually, implied throughout the, uh, the exploration and, and in the title too, is that naming, honoring, recognizing these is a huge step toward healing. It's, it's fundamental. And it's actually um, yeah, a crucial, essential part of the healing process. Now, I also hope that with this, when people hear planetary and earth, human, cosmos, and like that, it, it helps them to like bring these concepts to the ground and, and in a more approachable way. When I say person, I mean planet, and when I say planet, I mean person. It's, it's kind of like this breaking through duality that I'm trying to work with here. So for healing, I propose that, like I said, this is a huge, huge step. Um, naming what's there, honoring, recognizing, giving voice to the disease. Because, yeah, in this system, that's, that's not encouraged. That's hardly ever encouraged, and it's actually not, not, a, not a sanctioned thing to do, to go about the shadow that's not working. Um, so, <clears throat> so, so a suggestion, uh, Adrian. Yes. Uh, this is great, and I wish we had time to go through um, all of the columns for each of the elements. But I'm wondering if uh, it might be most helpful. We definitely want. I, I, I want everybody to hear something about your view of the uh, relationship of the between the elements elements and the elixirs. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that I also think is part of the original contribution of the study, which um, let's see. Pretty much the the healing that I'm proposing is based on this or it can be explained through an alchemical dictum of Dissolve and coagulate, which is at the heart of the hero's journey um, of separation, initiation, and return. And now that we've gone in, in, down into the pain, the eco psychic ailments, we've ventured into this foreign adventure and we've encountered challenges, ideally. We're born anew, healthier. We coagulate ourselves, we recreate ourselves in a healthier way. Uh, in deep, hopefully, relation to the earth and ourselves. So, dissolve, what is it there that needs to be dissolved? This, ideally, what is it that we're aiming at to coagulate? This. It hardly ever happens immediately, more gradually. So again, I base on um, yoga and Buddhist wisdom to propose a series of practices to cultivate this seeing ailment as Elixir. So, elixir I took from. So, in alchemy, it said that in order 
for us to transform the prima materia, the first matter, whatever it is in our psychic content that needs change, that needs healing, we need a little bit of, um, of that philosopher's stone, of that gold, of that, of that principle that would ideally transform that into healing into, into, I, uh, and take it all the way to its final expression as, as gold. And so these practices are designed and have been designed for thousands of years to cultivate this outlook in which we can see disease as an opportunity for healing. Um, maybe I should mention a little bit about Kriya Yoga of Patanjali since uh, these five are based on, on that same text. Kriya, the Kriya Yoga or the Kriya of Act, the Yoga of Action it's the one expression of yoga that is prescribed to deal with the effects of the kleshas and to cultivate a, a, um, a state of intimacy and communion and belonging. So there are three principles for that. Tapas, Vadhyaya, and Nishvara Pranidana. So the first one, it's magical heat. The second one is to, classically is the study of scripture and perhaps a recitation of sacred words, but it can also be interpreted as a self-study. And the third principle is surrender, surrender to the source. So what I'm suggesting is to use this as a template in which we can exert the power of Kriya Yoga of the Earth, Human, Cosmos. And so I equate each of those with an element, fire, earth, water, and by summoning those forces within ourselves we can enter uh, some sort of state of active contemplation. And the other part of the healing process, so I outline a number of practices like this one, which are more like contemplative, meditative in, in nature. And the other aspect of the healing uh, is brought about by the, re, the conscious reinsertion of the human into the fabric or into the dynamics of the earth. And for that, um, I use the different cycles of elements that I also associate. So each of these has a cycle, cycles through the earth, and enables life to manifest. So in a, in a, in a way of a shamanic journey, of then guided by each of the elements, we can once more, like I was saying in the part of the anthropocosmic vision, where one can gain an increased a religious experience by being becoming permeable to the world. In that same way, we can use the elements as means to consciously re-engage our whole being with the earth. So, by do by, in theory, by applying these practices. By journeying with the earth and with the elements, um, and also by ritualizing this, because this is also very, very um, important, interesting to me. That's another way that I propose that we can regain intimacy and a sense of belonging. Um, which is to say that we can also use, make use of the elements as guides of, of connection in a ritual way. That would be a way of understanding that would be that each of the elements it's as outlined here, it's a crippled elemental relation with the earth within ourselves and the earth community as a whole. So by summoning and working with these elemental forces, what we're doing is ideally setting free 
this eco psychic energy that um, breathes life into ourselves and the world. We're freeing that and reorganizing it at the service of the earth. So I think I should end now with a couple of things. So what are the main gifts of this? Well, the, the, the yoga of the earth, human cosmos of going from ailment to in a specific elixir which I wish, yeah. If I had more time, I would try to convey to you how come this one translates into each of these. Um, like I've been saying, giving voice, um, honoring, giving names, voicing, the pain, that is, that's perhaps the biggest gift of these, that in, the, in a way is a systematization of the pain for the world. The pain for the world, according to Joanna, is something new, that it's occurring not only our species, but the earth as a whole. Something kind of rather unfathomable, that it's, it's too pain to bear, too painful to bear. So what I'm, one of the things that I'm hoping with this is that this makes it a little bit more bearable. Another thing that the typology does is that it invites reflection of the deep entwinement between us and the earth. Why? Because if the mere formulation of some, of some, some disease at the nexus of ourselves and the earth, of the inner and outer, invites that, invites reflection of, of, of what, what's happening. Even our, perhaps my deepest longings are an intimate relation to what's happening out there. Um, by contemplating that, you may open up the possibility for healing by implementing the practices that I lay out. Um, there's a widened conception of health, which is one of the tenets of eco-psychology. We can have healthy people in a sick planet. So similarly, um, in order to really move in the direction of healing, we need to take into consideration the planet as a whole. That is to say, a, a movement toward healing is a movement toward wholeness. The earth as a whole reflects our wholeness, in a way. And wholeness, it's the other side of healing. So these work might not, some parts of these work might not be for everybody because it requires courage and willingness to open up to these. This is hard. But by laying out, that was one of the reasons why I didn't want to leave it, only this. By laying out some, a more complete a foundation of what it, this work can bring about, um, we may get a little inspired to engage in this work. And it's not necessar necessary to begin here. We can start cultivating these ones. We can start cultivating the gifts inherent to the elements now and make our way. See, this is not a linear progression, necessarily.
So one of the ways that I make sense of these is I've already shared, a systematization of the pain for the world. Another way of, of conveying what all this is about is um, the advancement of an expression of an integral eco-psychology. I mentioned in the beginning there is no standard definition of eco-psychology and what is it that it's about. But generally we can say it's a study of our psychological relation to the earth. With this I'm proposing, this is obviously grounded in spiritual wisdom, I'm proposing uh, the study of our multi-level connection to the earth with two aims. Uh, the first one is to ameliorate suffering and to propose ways in which we can move toward healing and self-discovery. And the third way to make sense of these is as a form of planetary yoga. Um, that if we follow Patanjali's system, there are eight limbs, and each of those can be not necessarily reworked, but interpreted in, through, the, through the lens, through an ecological lens, through an eco-psychological lens. So um, one of the main tenets of yoga is, is this, is to reduce suffering and to invite us to explore who we truly are. And um, what I'm trying to do here is something like that. Um, and I don't know if you remember that when I laid out the context of the planetization of humankind. Um, I love the way Sean puts it, and it's, 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 clear, it's clear that the, the human is becoming planetary, but the question is whether the planet is becoming human. And um, I believe that this can assist in that birthing, birthing ourselves as um, planets. Mm -hmm. Chris, since you're um, at a uh, perceptual disadvantage here. <laughs> yes, I hear you. Um, well, just so you know, there, there is a, a group of about uh, 30 of us here in the room. Oh, great. And, uh, but if you, if you would like to, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I'm wondering, early in the talk, I mean, you had mentioned the personality of the elements. And I wondered if you could choose your favorite element and describe its personality. <laughs> sure. Um, I think I'm going to go with fire. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so, the one of the reasons why I chose the, uh, to work with the elements is because of their universality. Uh, I made use of different traditions to create each of the elements' personalities. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, what I'm most interested in is that they're available for all, mm -hmm. regardless of our studies of them or not. So what I can say about fire is of course what I have here that perhaps one of its benevolent expressions is that of empowerment. It's of intensity, of change, is, is the essence of transformation. Um, it's very unstable. Um, it rules our metabolic functions. It's, for example, needed in different ecosystems for plants to flourish. Mm 
um, it is the main fuel of life in the planet as sunlight comes into our planet and is transformed by photosynthesis and that energy that fiery energy of the sun is made available for us all um, it's also can be very dangerous can be very disruptive can be very destructive if not handled properly um, it's said to be the only element where life is not able to dwell or to live within um, and um, the way that I'm approaching it here in the typology is that moving away this reactionary behavior reactive working against something it's, it's powered by this resentment, by this anger, by this sort of like tight but high level energy uh, that is based approach by fire, I mm. suppose. Something like that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, well, um, <clears throat> maybe I'll, I'll go next, and uh, you'll have a chance, uh, Chris, for at least um, one or two more rounds, certainly. Uh, but to follow on your, your question, Chris, and to you, Adrian, um, first of all, I want to, I should say, to begin with, just uh, I want to uh, make sure I praise you uh, and express my gratitude, first of all, uh, to praise you for what you've accomplished in the dissertation, not only from the obvious standpoint of having uh, masterfully integrated uh, many different traditions, you know, spiritual, religious traditions, and uh, scholarly, disciplinary traditions, eco-psychology, and, and so on, but uh, I think more fundamentally in having the courage to um, put forth what to the mainstream would be considered an archaic, uh, anachronistic, and basically deluded, superstitious worldview, uh, namely the elements, the idea of the elements, which were uh, disproven a couple of centuries ago, and you know, even though they guided cultures for so long, uh, they, they were rejected. And here you are putting them back at the center. And I guess my question, first question around that is sort of two parts of the question. One is, um, in, in a way, this could be, it could be argued that one of the key healing functions that you're doing is restoring an elemental consciousness which was lost. Uh, and, and more generally, the imaginal participatory potential of an elemental consciousness, which we don't get with the periodic table and with chemistry, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, now as I, and this just thought just occurred to me, I, I've had the intuition all along, but it, it didn't occur to me until just now, and, and Chris's question, uh, I don't, I can't remember whether you address that specific point, mm -hmm. the, the uh, uh, in, in the dissertation, the, um, uh, <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to suggest major revision. <laughs> <laughs> but do you want to, do you, can you say anything about that? Uh, yes. have, you, have you thought about the history of elemental consciousness and its, yeah, its fate in early modernity yeah. and, and the nature of your move relative to that? Yes. I do address it rather briefly, I should say, in chapter yeah. three. Good. <laughs> um, which I <laughs> maintain that I think there's 108 elements in the periodic table, something like that. Um, they do not have much value for us in our in our lives, in our direct experience of life, in how we connect with each other and how we conduct our lives, because they're rather abstract constructions. Um, and so what I do suggest in that chapter 
is that what can look as a regressive move uh, can actually serve, as they say, regression in the serve of transcendence, mm -hmm. uh, where made by making these moves, perhaps the main thing that we gain is the the recovery of an enchanted worldview by means of honoring different ways of knowing. Because it's pretty much what the elements are about, in a way. You know, there's different dimensions of who we are that allow us to communicate and make sense of things via their personalities. I didn't have time there to put the psychological functions associated with each of them and like that, but um, what I want also want to say about that is that <laughs> the one of the ways I handled that move was that these five represent the totality of our psyche, and um, going back to this primitive notion of the elements, this elemental consciousness uh, helps us in restoring or at least moving in that direction of reclaiming the wholeness of, of who we are. Um, and also in theory, like I was saying, the personal and the planet that's not to say that I guess that is to say that these can these recovery of an elemental consciousness can be enacted and applied for the healing of the industrial society, not only at a personal level. Because industrial society it, there it's based on um, disconnect from the earth on um, inflated sense of who we are and on the belief that there is an un uh, infinite natural resources so but these things rest in a deeper structure that was that that Sean was alluding to with modernity and, and and the, the mechanicism and reductionism and, and positivism and this flattening of reality uh, only to the physical dimension of it driven by money really in an industrial system Thank you <clears throat> I'll, I'll wait uh, for my second one to give uh, Craig a chance to get in here your response to Sean reminds me, I wish I could remember which eco-psychologist said this, but um, I think it was an eco-psychologist said it's, uh, we're not talking about going back, we're talking about getting back on track. So I like your response. Um, so um, I wanted to, add, actually I want to pose a, a bit of a challenge. Um, of course one of, the, one of the challenges, but also maybe um, practices or joys or whatever euphemism I can come up with at the last moment of a dissertation defense is to be able to respond very briefly to pretty huge questions. So I have one for you. And um, <laughs> so just, um, the, the ailments that you mentioned, yes. uh, you know, and we, you could teach an entire class on this, obviously, so it's an enorm enormous question, but just, just sort of off the top of your head, where do they start historically? Where, where, where do we get sick collectively historically, in, in your opinion? Um, that's a good question. I guess the most recent origin we could say is, that is the uh, Industrial Revolution. Um, where we, we gained the ability to affect the earth at a 
way larger scale than before mm -hmm. through mechanization, mm -hmm. pretty much. But, you know, we, it can go back to like the domestication of fire, mm -hmm. to um, the creation of the alphabet, um, to the emergence of cities, mm -hmm. to, and this is a big one, perhaps the emergence of agriculture mm -hmm. and domestication of, of animals and plants. Mm -hmm. So it, it is tricky to point a specific event. Yeah. Rather, uh, probably all of these contributed yeah. to this alienation, to this disease, which is better alienation because then uh, they, there's definitely some key diseases in our alienation from the earth but there's also maybe an equal side of potential life mm -hmm. and realization to be enacted by these, this journey of this connection from the earth um, which I'm trying to address by becoming a planet. Mm -hmm. that, that's one of the ways to address how to integrate the shadow of our disconnect, of our diseased psyche, and transform it for the healing, for personal and collective healing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, incidentally, I really like your image of becoming a planet. Mm -hmm. That's great, because it puts you into, the, into these questions like, what's happening on, on my surface and what's my atmosphere like and things like that. It's right. great. Uh -huh. you good for now? Mm -hmm. Craig, uh, uh, round two. Chris. Uh, sorry, Chris. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to pass and let it go on to the next one. Okay. Well, uh, let me continue then. Um, Do you, uh, I guess some people might say, like uh, ask, and you you seem to be alluding it to it to what I'm thinking of uh, as well, Adrian, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you 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 point out that the eco ailments are uh, hidden elixirs. So there's a there's a there's a potential. Um, gift and gold in all of the elixirs and would it also be true to say that there is a hidden elixir in the overall crisis the fact that like, the loss of the elemental view the growth of industrial society the birth of the ecological crisis mm -hmm. which is so is the crisis itself a hidden elixir, which, and if so, what what is that? So not the individual elixirs, but what is the, and more particularly, I guess, uh, are why these ailments? Why so? Why uh, why did these ailments arise to begin with? So you said industrial society, but I mean we didn't have to feel dread and anxiety and fear and so on as a result of that. So why why did these ailments arise to begin with? And is, uh, is it serving a purpose or is it just a kind of unfortunate development that we need to get out of? Well, I like to believe that it is serving a purpose. Otherwise, it would be hard to live uh, <laughs> or harder but um, well I guess I have two parts the first part is that maybe uh, from the perspective of the spiritual traditions that I based this study in these afflictions are just ingrained in the human condition. Mm. 
but so say for example the glaciers are, are said to be unveiled, discovered by rishis, by by seers for many many years and that was why one of the reasons why I chose to base this on on their visions because of their uh, deep insight into the nature of the mind and if we're going to be serious about healing then we might as well map what are the main obstacles that we need to face for according to them in order to realize who we truly are these are yeah, if, if I could um, just add something in here, when uh, the Buddha was asked, you know, why did this happen, why did that happen, he would say that ignorance and these other clashes have no beginning, but there is the possibility of bringing them to resolution, putting them to an end. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes, so say with what Buddha did under the Bodhi tree, that's what he did. Mm -hmm. Ideally, put these to rest. Mm -hmm. He transformed them. Uh, the way I address it in the document is that a person like that has the ability to transform these, to use them as a fuel for self discovery and healing and transformation. So perhaps the gift the elixir of the ecological crisis as a whole mm. is that to enact that effort to discover who we truly are in communion with each other with our deepest essence with the earth mm. at a collective level that's what I would I'd love to believe that that's possible mm. um, and it's so crucial because you see the, if we cultivate this this view of seeing the diseases are of, as opportunities for growth, then we're really rich, right, at this historical moment because of the ecological crisis. So, in, if if we see it in that way, evolutionarily, then there's a new opportunity for us as a species right now to gain perhaps a depth and a heights that we have <coughs> not experienced before. Mm -hmm. um, and I like to believe that that's the, one of the promises of this work and many others that we can connect in a different way that has never been, uh, that has never happened before with the Amrita of the world. Mm -hmm with the essence, with the elixir of the world itself. Mm -hmm. Nice, thank you. Chris, checking in with you. Yeah, no, I think that um, it's quite Nietzschean to um, have that wisdom that it's through difficulty that we're brought to resolution, and also thinking of William James, that it's the uh, sick soul that finds its way to um, the depths of understanding. Mm -hmm. So I would affirm um, that approach of, of putting name and voice to uh, the difficulty is, is a really important piece in the process. And if I were to formulate a question at this point, um, it would be some signal from Adrian in terms of the actual sorts of practices that one would want to engage in order to reconnect with the elements. Yes. So I have I outlined maybe about seven main practices. Um, I'm trying to decide which one mm -hmm. is to share. Maybe, mm, 
yeah, maybe the mind training practices that uh, find a ground in the Buddhist tradition. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the practices that I address is the four point mind training of Atisha. Mm -hmm. And um, when we're talking about cultivating these view of seeing calamity as opportunity, these are the kinds of things that are prescribed, which are deceivingly simple. Really deceivingly, because they can be very powerful. And they, and they prepare the, the terrain, perhaps, for more <coughs> intense practices. So the, the, these particular practices is, is based on four points. Mm -hmm. The first one is equanimity. And so the idea is, is for us to practice, to cultivate this as habits of the mind. And, and um, so as for them to guide our behaviors with ourselves and with others in society. Um, equanimity is the first point. Second point is <coughs> recognizing the faults of egoism or self-centeredness. Mm -hmm. The third one is recognizing the virtues of cherishing others. And the last point is the ability, and this is supposed to be like a, a secret, a holy secret of exchanging oneself for others. So um, what I did with this four points is to interpret them ecologically. So the first one would be aim for ecospheric egalitarianism, some sort of like deep ecology, where, where, we, um, where we see the value in all beings, where we not necessarily, it's a little problematic, but where we see value in all, in all beings and at a level we are the same, we, are, we have the same value, we are leveled with the close to 10 million species that are said to inhabit the planet and let that inform our decisions when we shop, when we you know, commute from one place to another, when we um, choose how we're going to word things, how we're going to express with our loved ones, etc. So the second principle uh, is really to recognize the potential catastrophic um, outcomes of the second eco-psychic element of the human superiority complex. To realize that there is some of that going on in each of us <coughs> to varying degrees and to take responsibility that that actively contributes to decimate the earth. And then let that inform us. The third principle would be to celebrate the value of the, the earth community, of the diversity of the earth community, of the different voices of the earth community because um, as I point out throughout the document, in many ways, if the psychological perspective holds true, is that they are crucial for well-being, all these voices. We need them for a sanity, both physically, psychologically, and even play a big part in our deepest dreams. And the last point would be this, to open to that multiplicity of voices and ways of knowing of the earth community. Because again, if we accept that they play a crucial part in who we are, by denying those, by denying those voices, we're denying ourselves, we're suppressing our true nature to emerge. And as we, and I've, as I've mentioned, that repression, that like obscurity, it's really one of the crucial 
issues mm -hmm. that needs tending. Right. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Last, last question. Um, for the for plants. Yeah, yeah. Oh, give me that. Yeah. Um, briefly, so there's a well, there's a, a habit um, of focusing on individual spiritual spiritual or psychological practices, or healing practices in general. Can you talk just briefly about a few implications for doing this kind of work in groups or collectively? Yeah, yeah, I, that's a very exciting uh, outcome for me because I think maybe this was never envisioned to be solely an academic endeavor. Uh, by academic, I mean in a classical way where it's only um, going to serve very few mm -hmm. and it's only be it's only going to be a value and a meaning to very few somewhere these ideally this needs to hit the ground it's like the next step would be that would be to for people to use it so one of the ways to go about that is to work in groups um, because I think that's underlying all these, it's, it's that, is the, is the sense that it's hard to talk about individual practice, individual development, individual growth, because really, maybe <coughs> not, well, yes, and there's this other huge dimension in which your individuality rests that might be wise to take into consideration. So by harnessing that eco-psychic energy that we share, um, one, I think we can get results faster or perhaps more enduring. And uh, two, which is builds community, which is so, need it because for example the, the, the mother of the ailments it's this ignorance of who we are this disconnect and uh, practices of reweaving that with ourselves as members of the human group with non-human entities serve that purpose, serve to reweave that connection with uh, mm -hmm. our core selves. So the ritual making that I'm very excited about and to do these practices that I outlined in chapter six in community, that would be really cool. Or um, the journeying, which we didn't talk much I envision those to happen also in, in group form. That would be really great. Because um, the, the group here is this, this field container and they could be much more powerful like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, it's uh, our custom, Adrian, uh, when we have um, uh, other faculty members in uh, attending to give them a chance and, and we're really fortunate tonight to have Joanna Macy who is uh, a distinguished uh, adjunct with um, CIS in general and, and so happily for us with PCC and I know has been um, not only a great contributor to this whole field uh, but has been a personal uh, influence on Adrian as well. I don't know Joanna whether you have any care to um, ask or say anything to Adrian at this point? Just clarification. I'd love to understand what you mean by eco aversion. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I mean, is that aversion to the ecological world or aversion to those who are destroying the ecological world? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So what I mean, I, I put together very neat definitions of each of them. Uh, so So what I mean is that once, yes, so for each of them, I at least proposed a main way to interpret it and a second one. So to, to give, to clarify perhaps what you're trying to address, because this is powered by resentment. And what that implies is that at an unconscious level, we're aware of the rift between us and the earth, and we are resented for it. And that causes aversive behaviors because of the industrial system, what it, some of the things that it does is to promote that the earth is something dirty, something wild, something untamable that we need to protect from. So that's where I'm coming from with the, with the aversion. The other question I have is I'd like you to move that piece of paper so I can see what's going <laughs> on. Ah. Inaction, fascination. Fascination. Um, Need of security. Fascination with beauty. There's more to it, but you want me to say something about that? Uh, and global dread yeah. is fear of global catastrophe. Yes, so these, this particular notion was coined by uh, Albrecht, so it's the one, the same person that, co that coined the term solastalgia. Mm -hmm. um, so what he meant by this is that fear of impending danger, of pretty much the viability of the Earth and future generations. Mm -hmm. So these, this one, Maybe I should have done that at the beginning. It's related to some sort of eco anxiety. Mm -hmm. But as it's related to the earth element, it kind of like freezes up, contracts us, that, that fear. So, so the, klesha, the Avinivesha klesha has to do with that, with the, with the clinging to life or fear of death that is said to be also in operation in, in the voice. So it's, it's a... Then in that case, uh, eco-despair? Yes. So eco-despair... Would not be, would, how is it different from eco-anxiety? Sure. So this one I, is your concept. And um, so this makes so much more sense when one knows a little bit about this. Uh, so this has to do with the um, um, repressed dimension, yes, with the repressed dimension of, repressed emotive dimension that the ecological crisis signifies to us. Which, this one, these two can be tricky because they're, two sides of the same coin, and um, someone would say that this is a more active expression which would go more in alignment with eco-aversion, mm -hmm. like, like this, mm -hmm. but what I'm suggesting by associating eco-despair with consumerism is that the, the pathological repression of our emotions mm -hmm. uh, manifests in such a need for like mm -hmm. stopping the pain, muting the pain. Mm -hmm. And so the way that that plays out is to, to grab whatever we have at hand to do that. They seem very different, the elements, in terms of their degree of pathology. Yes. 
I mean, I would see ego, despair, and dread as a higher form of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just being open right. to what's happening uh -huh. rather than uh, distorting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, thought about that. That's, that's, that's right. Yeah. Well, at this point, um, maybe um, if you want to carry on the conversation with with uh, everyone present. Yes. Uh, Chris, yeah. Craig, and I are, are going to uh, withdraw uh, and call you back. So I'm going to I'm going to hang up here and call you back uh, so we can deliberate. Then uh, we'll return to this room and call you back again from the speakerphone so you can hear, uh, hear the conclusion. Okay, perfect. Okay, talk to you in a minute. Great, thank you. So now you have to sweat it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I have a question. Yes, please. Okay, but first, but I need, need to get, get the, the phone, phone number. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. there it is. Should I just take it? Or, well, I'd like to know. record his response to my okay. question. <laughs> so just let me, so bear with me, everyone here. Uh, I'll try 310 410 9721.